much. Hi, my name is Jamie Swift. I use she, her pronouns. Thank you all so much for joining this last salon curated by the one and only Trinice McNally um, and Virgil Abloh, who are the creative directors of the I Support Black Women campaign. Thank you, Trinice and Virgil, once again, for just creating this wonderful series. And shout out to Black Discourse for hosting this amazing salon series. Um, please feel free to drop your name, your pronouns, and where you're listening from or where you're joining from. Um, I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce this event. Um, and really just once again, so honored, 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 honored to be here. So this event is about resisting in Black feminisms, um, about Black feminist transnational organizing and solidarity. And so before we get started with the event, just want to make sure that we establish community ground rules and also to acknowledge um, Indigenous communities and standing in solidarity with those um, Indigenous communities, and particularly in the United States. So I'm calling in from Lenape land, which is now known as Philadelphia, um, and also representing Piscataway land, which is uh, uh, Washington, D.C. So thank you all so much for dropping your names, your pronouns, and where you're listening from. And also just let us continue to be in solidarity with um, those as we resist to fight for liberation. Um, before we get started, just really want to establish some community ground rules. Um, like I start all uh, events for Black more radicals, this is a safe space, right? We do not allow any white supremacy, homophobia, queerphobia, ableism, transphobia, you name it, we don't accept it here. So please just be considerate of our space and honor our amazing guest, Anneli Frankel. And let's get started with this wonderful conversation. Pass it over to you, Trinice. Can folks hear me? Dope, dope, cool. Hey y'all, so my name is Trinice McNally. I'm a black queer feminist migrant. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm from London, England by way of St. Mary's, Jamaica. And I'm the founder of the I Support Black Women campaign with Virgil Abloh and Off-White. I think today I'm experiencing a bunch of mixed emotions like excitement and pride and sadness and really a lot of honor about today's conversation with my dear friend, Jamie Swift of Black Women Radicals and my dear soror and comrade, Anieli Franco. Um, I kind of want to take us back for a minute to kind of get us grounded in how this campaign started. Um, you know, so when I first met Virgil Abloh last summer, after co-leading the Defend Black Women March on Juneteenth of last year here in DC, I had no idea that I would be able to execute a campaign, create a salon series, work with so many dope folks like folks from Black Discourse, designers, uh, meet Black feminists from across the globe, talk with uh, POC designers, create a photo campaign that featured Black women organizers, and raise money to start a school for Black feminist politics. Even sitting front row at an off-white fashion show during Fashion Week. And that still like wows me out, y'all. Like, oh, Jamie and I had the opportunity to go there, right? Like growing, growing up with my experience, I never thought that something like that would be possible. And that's just a couple of things of what we've been able to accomplish in less than a year with this campaign. Uh, this campaign, like this conversation, is important for so many reasons. The first one being Black women deserve abundance. We deserve to be listened to. We deserve to be respected and also supported. Uh, we live at so many intersections like race, gender, and class that shapes our conditions before we're even old enough to talk. And historically, Black women and gender expansive people were forced to be resilient and leaders of rebellion and also resistance. For me, this campaign served as a conduit for political education, possibility, imagination, and luxury. This conversation has brought the campaign full center today in this moment, back to how this opportunity began with me wearing this machete belt attached to my industrial belt. Cause you know, stay grounded, but keep it fly. Virgil DM'd me and the rest is history. Today, our conversation is about centering black feminist transnational organizing. And I couldn't be more proud. I wanna ask folks to stay, um, sorry, stay tuned for the continuement of this work to follow Black Women Radicals and to learn more about the work that's happening about Black feminists from across the globe and to follow Black Discourse on Instagram for really dope programs, podcasts, and opportunities to engage in political education as well. I wanna say thank you to everyone who participated in this campaign, starting with Virgil Abloh, who took the time to believe in my work and brought Jamie along. Thank you to Jamie, 
Thank you to folks at Black Discourse, all the Black women organizers who had an opportunity to be featured, and really Black and brown young people across this world who have hit us up, who have liked our photos, who have wanted to be in conversation with us. Um, and more importantly, in this moment, to Anieli Franco, um, my dear soar, someone that I'm really proud to say is a Delta, someone that I'm proud to say is a comrade, um, to be in conversation with you, to not just talk about an icon, a badass Black feminist, um, but your sister. So thank you. And I'll pass it to Jamie. Yes, thank you once again to Trinice and Virgil and the Black Discourse team. It's been an honor to be a part of this conversation. And I'm just going to do some context setting into the I, more about the I Support Black Women campaign, but also about this conversation and particularly what it means to me. Um, Yes. So as I said before, my name is Jamie Swift. I'm the creator and executive director of Black More Radicals. And if you're not familiar with Black More Radicals, we are a Black feminist advocacy organization dedicated to uplifting and centering Black women and gender expansive people's radical activism in Africa and the African diaspora. I'm also the creator of the School for Black Feminist Politics, which is the Black Feminist Political Education Hub and initiative of Black More Radicals, with, which has a mission of expanding the a reference of Black politics through the power of Black feminisms. So please support the fundraiser to help us open a physical location for the school in the greater Washington, D.C. area. And there should be a link in the chat to direct you where to support. I just want to say thank you once again to Trinice and Virgil for choosing nine Black feminists of all different backgrounds to be a part of this campaign and for wanting to support the school. Um, but most importantly, I want to speak to you, Agnelli, and why I'm, I'm grateful to be speaking with you right now. When I was 19, I had the opportunity to study in Salvador da Bahia, Brazil. It was from that experience I learned that Brazil housed the largest Black population in the African diaspora, only second behind Nigeria. I was not taught that in school, K through 12, my graduate programs, none of it. It opened up my eyes to the possibilities of Blackness and ways of being elsewhere in the world. I remember when I first learned about Marily Franco and her radical leadership and activism. I remember learning about how she was always standing up and spoke out for underrepresented communities in Brazil, Black, LGBTQ+, more poor, and women how she was vocal about the impacts of anti-Black police violence in her hometown of Mare and beyond. Her life, leadership, and legacy inspired me so much so that I wrote my dissertation in honor of her, and specifically about Afro-Brazilian queer, travestis, and transgender activists, organizers, and denizens who have lost their lives to state violence and who are organizing and working actively to combat oppressive structures that gravely impact the lives of Black communities in Brazil. Marily inspired me to always stand in solidarity with Black feminists in Brazil and around the world. So to be able to speak to you, Agnelli, Uma Guijera, a warrior, in your own right is my honor. So this conversation is for Marily Franco, for Anderson Pedro Gomez, for Matusa Passarelli, for Luana Barbosa dos Reis, for Rafaela Sousa, for Sandra Bland, for Asante, Ashanti Carmen, and for Brianna Taylor, and for so many others. Solidaridade agora e para sempre, and a luta continua. Solidarity now and always, the fight continues. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie and Trenise. I'm so glad to be here with you guys. It's so important for me to construct and build together, you know, over boundaries, Brazil and the U.S., because I've been many years, for many, many years there, and for being here today with you guys, exchanging knowledge is very, very important for me. So in behalf of my family and me, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get into this conversation. Um, so we really want to talk about, like Trinice was saying, the importance of Black transnational feminism and transnational feminist organizing. So to you, Agnelli, we want to talk about solidarity because solidarity seems to be like the key piece, right? Um, so what does solidarity mean to you and who are some historical and contemporary Black feminists in Brazil we should know about? Yes. Um, first, I will start the last question first. Uh, before we started, you were talking about Sueli Carneiro, and Sueli Carneiro for me is one of the most important Black feminists in Brazil. But 
Sueli Carneiro is now launching a Sueli Carneiro's house, which has been building by a girl named Bianca Santana. And she is a very contemporary Black feminist in Brazil right now that you should know. I can send you guys and I can write in the chat. But Bianca Santana has been writing and researching and doing a lot. And the way we can know that she's doing a great work is that the president hates her. So every time she does something great for the Black women or for the population in Brazil, they always come and, and create some fake news. Because you know, Jane, we are living a very difficult moment in Brazil with fake news. They are always saying something, especially about Black, men, black women and Black girls here. Um, so I would say Bianca Santana. I would say also Lucy Xavier, which is a, a lady, she's a little bit older than me, but she has been in this game for a long, long time. And she has been doing a lot with her ONG and helping many, many women, especially now over the pandemic time, you know? So Bianca, Lucia, we also have Flavia Oliveira, which is a black journalist in Brazil. And Flavia has been doing so much because, you know, here in Brazil, we don't have that many black women on TV. So when we finally get the space to do it so, we feel so, you know, like it's someone representing us. But these are the ones that are coming up now. But, you know, like you said, we have Lera Gonzalez, we have Lucia Xavier, we have Jurema Werneck, which works on Amnesty, International Amnesty. We have, uh, especially besides uh, Bianca Santana, we now have Sheila Carvalho, which is another woman that is a lawyer. And she has been working very close with Marielle Franco Institute to discuss about the, the political violence that we have been suffering here, you know? But when it comes to solidarity, like for me, it's very important because when people killed my sister, they fired me from two schools that I used to teach. And only the black women gave me their hands and said, hey, look, don't be sad, we're gonna be with you, so let's work together, you know? It's so difficult here in Brazil to find people who look at you and be like, no, you're gonna be here standing right beside you. And I only found that on my Brazilian girls, black Brazilian girls. Thank you for sharing that and dropping all of these names. We're gonna be dropping them in the chat, y'all. I was writing down some of the ones that Jamie already hasn't taught me about. Um, so now that we've kind of got a good grounding around solidarity and folks that have been supporting the work in Brazil, can you share with us some moments or experiences that politicized you? Yes, definitely. Before I go live in the US, I used to live in Mare, which is one of the biggest uh, slums in Rio de Janeiro. It's right close to the airport. So whenever you come to Rio and you drop on the airport, you're going to see Maré on your left side. It's like one of the biggest ones beside Rocinha. And I used to remember that my mom used to tell us, you need to be the best that you can because you are a favelada, people who live and are grown, born and raised in favela, but you are Black. So she always used to tell us that, but I was younger than my sister, like five years younger. And I never really understood what she was saying until I become a teenager. And once we were having a police operation in the favela and everybody, they were like making sure to see the documents, right? And people who didn't have documents, they would just like slam their face like hit on the face or hit on the head, hit on somewhere. And my mom, she always hold our documents, like me, my sister and hers. And that day she looked at me and my sister and said, that's what I'm talking about to you because you always have to obey me. When I say you have to study, you have to be you know, compromised with your documents, where you go here and that. And I was very young on that. And a couple months after that, I started playing volleyball, and that's why I went to live in the U.S. Uh, they had another operation, and they killed almost 10 people on my street, on our street. 
And we went to protest after that. And they hit my sister and they hit my mom. And I was very young. And my daddy was with us too. And they just used to hit everybody who were protesting against that violence that we had been suffering. And those two episodes like marked me a lot because I grew up looking at political violence. And maybe 25 years later, I see my sister getting killed, you know, with five shots on her head in Brazil. And that is something that marked my whole life, my entire life. So when I had the opportunity to leave Brazil, my mama said, no, you have to go. Like, you're going to be still here. But she just wanted me to leave. And the opportunity that I have to get to know the U.S. and come back to Brazil and, you know, and share both experience is a lot. But to, to end my, my, my speaking for this answer, for this question, sorry, few months before my sister get killed, we went to a public hospital in Brazil and it's like a big complex, like hospitals, church, schools, only public things. And we went there because some of the security guys had raped the women who were there, like in jail, and they were very young. They were like maybe 16 and 18. And we went there to protest about that. And they were like, oh, you can go uh, make this whole noise in Cuba, you know, because every time you say something Brazil and you're going to protest against the violence, they'd be like, oh, you should leave Brazil. You should go to another country. And some of the episodes, I'm just like kind of like trying to be the, the most important one for me in my life, for you guys to understand that many things make me be uh, politicized like I am today, but I learned it with the struggle, you know? I learned it seeing my friends getting killed. I learned it seeing we going to a school and they had no food to give us or no teacher being paid and saying like, oh, I'm not gonna stay here. So that's the way I learned. And then when they killed my sister, I said, I'm not gonna be quiet here. So I need to do something more than I have been doing with her. Wow, um, thank you so much for sharing and also providing some settings on what it means to be Black in Brazil. Um, and I think that's really important for other Black folks around the world to learn about the Blackness and ways of being. Um, so my next question for you is, what is the mission of the Mari Lifranco Institute and why was the Mari Lifranco Institute created and how can we support in uplifting the life leadership and legacy of Marielli. Yes, Jamie, we create the institute right after the killing of my sister. And we were trying to put in the institute everything that we do like nowadays, you know, like for example, they hate Marielli here. Like people from the political side that are like against her, they keep saying like fake news about her every other day. So we are trying in the institute to work that, like to defend her memory and to inspire another black women, you know, because most of the time when we start talking about black people in general, they look at us and be like, oh, we don't want to hear that. They think and they say that in Brazil, we don't have racism, but we do have. So in the institute today, I try to defend her memory, you know, to keep the legacy alive. We try at the same time to do a lot of work for people to understand that Marielle Franco was killed with five shots on her head. And spite of the place that where she was and what to defend, she was killed. And we don't deserve that to anyone in Brazil, you know, even though if you think different from us. So that's the point here. That's what people don't understand and what they don't get. So our mission is to potentialize, to inspire, and to make sure that people are not gonna forget Marietti. For you to give an, to have an example, I've just launched this. This is a, a I don't know, like a story quadrinhos. I don't know how to say in English. It's like a Cartoon, though. Yeah, a cartoon. Yeah. 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 And we launched this today here in Brazil. It means uh, Marielle Franco Raizes. 
it come when she came from, you know, like her teenage time. And we're going to be launching next week on her birthday, because I believe that people who used to vote already know Marielle, but many of our teenage girls who live in the favela and, you know, to live in favela, he is very complicated. And most of these girls think that they don't have anything else to do only, you know, be with drug dealers and all that. So we are trying to give this on public schools and talk about Marielle power, you know, the way Marielle was raised, how she had a baby with only 18 years old and how she survived about that. So this is the type of mission that we have in the Institute. We have been working a lot nationally and internationally about political violence here. Our girls who were elected last year, they have been suffering many threats in Brazil. So they, most of them are not living in Rio anymore because every other day someone threatened them. You know, so our mission is to keep this live and alive and especially for black women to look at us and say, you know, I want to be in this fight and I want to be uh, with the Institute and I want to work and I want to learn more about them. So we're doing a lot. We're doing political violence. We're creating books. We are creating lives on Instagram with intellectual women, like so they know a little bit more about their history, like, you know, Black Month history and Black women, because most of them have no idea what they can do and just be like, oh, I'm not going to fight against them. But once they get the knowledge to know the power, so they come together with us, you know. So we've been trying to organize a lot of things here, a lot of stuff. But it's been difficult because, you know, uh, our president is horrible. So every time we try to do something to talk about Marielle, he always come up with some fake news with something wrong about, especially with black women. But we are resisting here. Yes, and continuing to resist and being an example for resistance around the world. and to that point, why is it important that we continue to say yeah. the name of Marily Franco and Anderson Pedro Gomez and to push for justice for, for their lives? Yes, I think that there is one very important thing to say about that because we still don't know who ordered to kill Maria. It's like three years, almost four years, and we still don't know. Like last week, the people who were in the case like investigating, they asked it to leave. So they jumped out because they said they have no security to continue with the case. So we imagine that there is someone very, very powerful behind that. You know, we don't know who is, but we do have. And that's why this is like one of the biggest uh, reasons why we need to continue because people still don't know who wanted to kill her. And they have two guys in jail right now who supposedly um, shot her, but the person who paid for it and who asked to do it, we still don't know. So um, we don't want to let Marielle and Anderson, you know, be forgotten. So whenever you can, like we always put things in Portuguese and English on our Instagram. So to support us or even just to share and, you know, talk to someone about us and maybe this person can support or whatever. But everybody, every time we talk about Marielle Franco uh, assassination, we always talk about democracy because it's unbelievable that uh, uh, a former political, you know, women get elected with 45,000 votes and people shot her and we don't know anything. And the police don't answer, government don't answer us. Like we had no justice besides what we've been doing with the Institute, you know, because they don't care. Government are not care about what happened to Marielle. So that's why it's so important for us to be, you know, either on, on TV, on Instagram. So every time we do something new, like the book, we put on medias, you know, to so her, uh, so her name and other so not be forgotten. Thank you for that, Anjali. And it feels like, you know, I'm hoping that folks are getting from this conversation that anti-blackness is global, y'all. 
And it's important, not just for this work to be continuing in Brazil, right? But for us to truly be in solidarity. You know, if you notice the first question that Jamie asked was about solidarity. And there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't know these names. There's no reason why we shouldn't know the folks that are doing this work uh, in Brazil and in the global South and beyond, because if you ask them, they know who the folks are in the US, right? So like, what is the commitment yeah. that we are gonna make to ensure that we're truly in solidarity and not just using hashtags and using folks' uh, names and lives in vain, but what is the interest, right? What is the commitment? So I really appreciate you sharing that and really providing the context because if folks are listening who live in the US who may not know anything that we're talking about, I know they can relate to everything you just said, right? Because black struggle across the globe is not the same, but it is always similar, right? Because of the ways that fascism and white supremacy work. So, I just hope that folks are getting the gems, getting the insight, getting the context, and they're able to utilize it to our lens here in the US. Um, and this is my next question for you. I know that Black Brazilians have always found a way to create spaces that celebrate and honor Black identity and resistance. Can you share what advocacy, community, and political work as a two-time HBCU graduate have shaped your commitments and your current role and really prepared you for who you are now? Yes. Um, Trace, I'm so glad and, you know, I, I don't even know what words to use because have lived Mare in Rio and go to Texas and then North Carolina, Florida and Louisiana and then coming back to Brazil shaped me to be the women that I am today and helped me a lot, like to be in a Delta, to be a member of, you know, 100 Black women to do like community service so much. I learned how to do that in the US. And when I came back to my country, I used to think like the difference of seeing the organization that you had in the US and how actually black people used to get together. But in Brazil, people who are like, oh, if I am light skin, I'm not considering a black person. Like sometimes we have these here. And sometimes this person just look at you and be like, I don't wanna hear that girl. Like, you know, move on. But this whole experience and combine both countries for me, it shaped me a lot. It helped me a lot. When my sister was running, you know, to be a politician, I remember that when we sat down and thought about how we're gonna organize this, how we're gonna use like this advocacy, how we're gonna communicate to people, how we're gonna, you know, put in the paper what project we're gonna do, I thought about a lot about what I have been living in the US. It's so grateful to see today that in the Institute, I can bring a lot of this that I had in the, from the US here, but at, at the same time, combined with the black women from Brazil, for example, Suede Carneiro, and sit with her because my third master degree here in Brazil, she's the one who like uh, guiding me and she's helped me a lot with my paper. And it's wonderful to hear that, oh, you are doing the right thing, you know? Because there is something that Brazilian women know how to do is to fight and to resist because most of us, we lose sons, daughter, you know, husbands. We are always losing someone here, especially in Rio, because they don't care every time if they need to kill or if they feel like killing Black people, they will kill and that's it. And education here is not something, unfortunately, that the government uh, puts some money on. It's different from the US, you know, because there we have a lot. And this, the, I'm just doing like a lot of topics because this is what I am today. But I'm so glad and I'm so thankful for what I've learned there. And for being today a leader, an activist, you know, a black feminist here, and people looking at us and be like, look, the Institute is doing a great job. You need to continue this and to listen to this from like old women who came like before us and we admire so much like Sueli Carneiro. It's so great, you know, and so grateful. I truly believe that when we're thinking about if we prepare for our current role, I think I am, but I never thought about being what I am today after this whole killing, you know, of my family. 
because when they killed my sister, we start being the aim for them. So I've been threat, my niece has been threat because we're doing something here, because we're doing something different here. You know, we don't talk about black women for us. We talk about black women and black people from outside Brazil. We talk about from outside Rio and we are trying to do so much. When I think my whole HBCU experience and bring to Marielle Franco schools, that is something that we dream of doing. I be like, it has to do something like that because I've never had a black teacher before I come to the US. You know, I only had black professors there. I didn't have here at all. And I think that our current role now is to make sure that black women here can be the protagonists of their lives before maybe they get killed because that is so hard in Brazil. Like I don't want, you know, my daughter to grow up and be killed like my sister did or so many others that we know, like we honor them in the beginning of the conversation. So this is what I feel like, I feel like I'm prepared, but every time I see one of us get shot, I feel like, oh my God, no, maybe I stop doing it. Should I give up on it? But I know that this whole experience makes me ready to be the woman that I am today, but at the same time, it's not easy at all. It's not easy. Yeah, and um, I just want to thank you for your just willingness to talk about everything. Um, we like really appreciate it. Um, and also just for you to talk about your experiences at HBCUs. I went to HBCU and also kind of the privileges um, and I'll talk about myself in the context of me being a black woman growing up born in the United States, being able to travel to Bahia and like having the experience of being taught by a black professor, then going to Brazil, which has the largest black population in the world outside of Nigeria and you not being able to have a black professor, right? So talk about the ways that certain black people are able to maneuver um, around. And so thank you for sharing that context. And also just wanna, wanting to uplift some like great black women organizations in Brazil, like Geladez and um, Odara Black Women's Institute um, in Salvador. And uh, I think forgetting the other one by Jurema Werneke, Criolia. Um, yeah and just uplifting those amazing black feminist organizations as well, including the Maria Li Franco Institute. So the next question, um, there was a recently, the Maria Li Franco Institute released a report on political violence against black women. Um, you spoke about it a little bit, but may you please speak more about the report and how political violence impacts black women and gender expansive communities in Brazil? Yes. Um, last year, our election was majorly virtually, right? So people, they, the, the, the girls were not going to the street to make campaign. So we did this research and what we found about was we had 151 women who had answered. And these women suffered a lot of violence, such as they were cursed out. People like create fake news. Again, we are living in Brazil, this fake news era. Um, but something that always caught our attention was that sometimes the people from their party, the political party did not care. So if they had suffered any kind of violence, they would go to, for example, oh, I'm gonna go to press charge. They get there, people would say, oh, you have to go to your political party. And once they get there, they would say, we cannot do anything, just leave with, you know. To be a woman, I mean, in every kind of words is very difficult, but in Brazil, people always looking at us like we are nothing, you know, even though you are a politician. So today, after this research, we had many of those women who had answered the research. Now they are doing, they are under any program of protection because they cannot act like, you know, like put their job on a daily basis. They can't. They can't go because people want to kill them. They can't go anywhere because people want to curse them out. 
So the, the whole research showed us what we always see in like, you know, walking on the street, but at the same time bring, brought us numbers. And a lot of these women today are in any type of way thinking about giving up their spaces. You know, they don't want to be politicians anymore. Some of them just say, oh, I don't want to be a part of this because I can get killed and I don't want to be the next Marielle. A lot of them say it. And, you know, we have no, no laws here to protect them that give them uh, like private security, for example. We don't. So most of the time we try to do um, big events to talk about that and let people know what's going on in Brazil because some most of the time they don't let us know, you know. So it's very, very difficult when we come to, to, to this research, you look and you feel like crying because it was so many things and so many stuff that happened that we have no idea where we go from here, you know, Damon Trinis, because out of 152 women, like 148 suffered any type of violence. It's like, it's a lot. And then like 251, uh, every time they would do a campaign, like 249 were cussed out because they were black um, or because their religious way were like different from the other, or because they used to, you know, say something about Marielle, especially if they talk about Marielle, sometimes they could not even enter spaces to talk about or to do their campaign. So the, the, the whole research was good for us to understand a lot of things, but at the same time, it is sad because I asked people who are gonna take care of these black women after they be elected? Who are gonna protect them? We have no one to do it. So the same thing that happened to my sister, it can happen to any of them, you know? Thank you for that. I'm really excited that Jamie asked that question about reports because I have like a couple of students that are on the line who wanted to learn about the reports and the research that's happening in Brazil. And it's so interesting to me that what you're talking to us about, right? And what's happening in Brazil in terms of black women, our political landscape looks a little different here, right? Like in terms of black women and how we're seeing more black women get elected into office or even having successful campaigns. And I, I just wanna keep reiterating um, to the people on this call, the people that are going to watch this on YouTube who missed it, that is really important to understand what is happening to Black people, in particular Black women, especially in Brazil, right? Because I think Brazil, there's so many lessons historically that we need to learn and to understand. I mean, Brazil was the last to abolish slavery, y'all, as the most Black people outside of Nigeria, like Jamie told you. And I think that we often forget and we get caught up here in the US, right? In a Western imperialist place that the US, right? Is the only folks that are impacted by state sanctioned violence and police violence um, from black women in particular. And I mean, just listening to what you're saying, Anieli, about the fear that people are walking away with and still yet being brave, right? Like still having the courage to not just participate in the studies, but to say yes, and to have legitimate fears, right? Because they understand um, I mean, that's more than admirable. That's more than brave. Um, I can't even articulate like what that what that could mean for us here in the US and how we need to learn and how we need to be. Um, and I kind of want to just transition us into another question as we get ready to close. Um, we know for so many, Marielle Franco is a hero, a guiding light, an icon. Um, but we know that to you and to your family, she's your sister, right? She's your daughter, she's your mom. When did you understand what she meant to Black feminists of the diaspora? And how do you use this to inspire you and keep you going? I think, Trinice, I understood when I was around 20 to 21 years old, because here in Brazil, people think that they can say whatever and women should be quiet. And I've learned my sister and my mom, that's not gonna happen to our family, you know? So every time, since I, I always play volleyball, I'm a little tall. So people used to be like saying whatever and they expect us to be quiet. But 
as time were passing and my sister was working as a politician and every time I come from the U.S. to Rio, I spend a lot of time with her. I saw my sister become a giant, you know, even before she'd be elected. And we've been through so much, like we had uh, bad relationships. We had daughters, you know, with that type of man that we should not have done before. And we had so many experiences, but at the same time, we've been through so much that we look at our parents and be like, okay, one day we struggle, but the next day we need to be up, you know? And when they killed her, it was like that moment that I look at my mom, my niece, my daughters and said, what Marielle would do if she was here? Like if I had been killed, what my sister would do? I've never given an interview before. And I was the girl who was like behind the scenes, like writing with her. And all of a sudden I was the person who people were like, oh, and now you need you here, you need you to speak, you need you to write. And I became that person that I admired looking at my sister and my mom. And I had no choice, you know? I know sometimes I, I, I feel like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I should go. Should I do here? Like, should I trust this person? But sometimes we don't even have time for that because Brazil is so difficult to live and at the same time to keep moving that if you stop and think, you know, something's gonna happen and you're gonna be left behind. So we had no option. Like I had to learn the, through my throughout my struggles, but at the same time, I get inspired a lot from my family, from the women from my family, from looking at my niece, who were the only daughter that my sister had. And I saw my sister working like three shifts, like morning, afternoon, and night to, you know, to put food on her table. And to look at her now, I have no option besides keep going and keep moving. You know, I cannot give up because of them, because of everything that's going on. So if I know that Marielle has become this whole giant, you know, and she means a lot to black feminists, but I only understood that unfortunately after they had killed my sister, because when I saw people from across the globe speaking about her, when I saw people like selling t-shirts, you know, cups, anything from her, that's the type of thing that inspired me. But my inspiration comes from seeing how hard she worked, my mom worked, and my whole family, and many Black women who are today like side by side with me, has been working to survive this whole crazy country, pretty much. Most definitely. Um, and for like, as we move on through the conversation, I just also want people to realize that Brazil is also a center of radical Black resistance, particularly Black women leading resistant or resistant movements, right? Like thinking about the Quilombos and thinking about thinking about Dandara dos Palmares and Maria Felipe de Oliveira and yourself, Agnelli, like and Marieli Franco and so many other amazing Black Brazilian women who've been at the forefront of movements, right? Um, and like, as Trini said earlier, oftentimes we don't know about them, but when I was studying in Brazil, like everyone knew about like Black American feminists or even, for example, Caribbean American feminists like Audre Lorde. I have an Audre Lorde book in Portuguese, yes. Brazilian Portuguese or Bell Hooks, or I mean, Lillard, Alice Walker, like these books are in Portuguese, but how often are, um, you know, Beatrice Nascimento's books translated into English. Now there's one, uh, there's there's works of her translated into English, but it's it's very few, right? And so Marielle was dedicated to those who are most marginalized in society, Black, LGBTQ, women, and more. She also utilized a saying during her campaign, El sol porque no somos, I am because we are. So what can we learn from Marielle's solidarity as a Black feminist tool and strategy? Yes, I think we have a lot to learn, especially because uh, Marielle started to be a Black feminist when she was very young. She got pregnant with 18 years old, 17 to 18. And I remember how, even though she was pregnant, she was still going to protest. She was still going outside the street every time 
one of us got killed. She worked a lot and she built herself to be one of the greatest politicians, one of the great, greatest politicians that I've ever seen, that I've ever seen in my whole life. Until this day, Jamie, I, I tell you, when I look at the women that came after Marielle, with our respect, I don't see people with that powerful, you know, like the way that she speak, the way that she used to put herself. So I would say that we had a lot to learn, but at the same time, she had learned that from someone. And I would say that was from a mom. <laughs> And who today, I don't know how my mom survives up to this day because she is still crying every other day for my sister. But at the same time, she has so much power and strength and, you know, like, uh, and dreaming of seeing this country better. So I cannot speak here about one without speaking about the other. You know, it's kind of like that. And when Marielle got elected, I saw many Black women from the favelas, for example, single moms, for example, uh, LGBTQI plus women, Black women, like trans women, coming to her and saying, look, you represent me. So you go there and do the best. And I kept thinking if that was one of the reasons why these people killed her. Because every other day, Black women would go to the place that she used to work and be like, hey, we here, we just wanna say thank you. You know, they don't like that. They don't like the way we act, the way we speak, the way we walk, the way we dress ourselves. They used to make fun of Marielle's clothes. They used to talk about her hair, you know? And even though they used to do that with her, she used to go every day into that place, you know, with, uh, red lipsticks and to put her hair up and used to be like oh they're gonna learn to deal with me because i'm not leaving anywhere so i think there are a lot to learn from her but i would say that one thing that I, that i would highlight was like her strength the way that she used to say i'm not gonna put my hair down i'm not gonna do they're not gonna make me be quiet i'm gonna speak and that's it you know, and that's why I think they call Marielle was so uh, the, the person that they killed before even other, other girl here. Because the way that she used to behave herself and how she used to speak and her strength and the way she didn't let people feel like, oh, we're not gonna change the world. She always used to say, no, we're gonna change and we're gonna start from the black women first. Period. I mean, I am because we are, Jamie and I are planning some things and it just feels like validation and confirmation on Yelly, like just black women in defiance, right? Like how many times and why do black women constantly have to literally fight just to exist, right? In our humanity and yeah. in our dignity. And she yeah. was someone who was in her dignity and humanity, whether you liked it or not. And I mean, I don't know any person who could not understand how inspirational she was and continues to be um, for all of us across the globe. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you're talking to us about her because this is not just a literary figure, right? Or icon, this is your sister, a person that you live with, um, care about and love. And I just wanna always hold space for that um, because how, we're, it's an honor for us to be in conversation with you. And to close, um, I think you've dropped so many gems, you know, and I kind of wanna hear your call to action um, like what advice would you give black women across the diaspora that are fighting? Um, what are the things you want us to remember and to stay grounded in as we continue this work and we continue this fight? Well, I think that I would say that we only can change things if you are united, you know, like I don't believe that I can do it by myself. I feel stronger when I am with you. Uh, that's the why I always say here in Brazil also, because people will be like, oh, I can do it. No, we have to do it together. And I've been learning this the hard way because when they killed my sister and I had no jobs and I had nowhere to go and I just don't know what to do because mm, a lot of people used to love her, but other people used to hate her. I felt like what I'm gonna do and black women came together and stand up their hands for me. 
So today, I would say that the more united we can be, and more closely, even though we are, you know, in Brazil and the U.S., the more powerful we are, and the more powerful we can be. I don't know if I'm doing the, like, you know, everything completely right, but I'm pretty sure that my sister is very proud for what we're doing here. And when I remember that most of the times we didn't have food on the table, we didn't have money to go to work, and sometimes we used to go walking and to look and see how far we got today. It's kind of like that poem, like Invictus, that I had to learn when I was becoming a Delta. And I keep thinking about that. And if I would say is, we not gonna regret, you know? We're gonna go from here up. We're not gonna be quiet. We're not gonna, you know, uh, accept the way they be treating us. And we are going to be the protagonists of our own lives, even they want or not. That's, that's what I think that's gonna happen. And that's what I would say for everyone who's like, listen to us today, because there is no way and there is no option to give up and stop fighting because we need a better place and a better word for our Black people. Wow, um, just thank you so much, like grateful for this conversation. So thank you. Woo, I just want everybody and, to say <laughs> No, I need to say thank you because it was awesome. and. I know I'm so glad you talking about the books because, you know, sometimes I'll be here trying to get some books and I mean, I can read in English, but sometimes people don't, you know, and it's so hard for us too as well. And now they are translating more. Yes, it's so, um, and I can share it in the chat too, but um, I'm trying to recall names, but Dr. Kristen A. Smith, and yes. um, Maria Beatriz Nascimento's daughter, Bethania Gomez, I think I'm saying. Oh, I say yeah. That. Um, yes, they actually correct. translated Beatri uh, Beatriz Nascimento, some of her works into English, right? Um, and there's books by Consencial Evericho that's in English. And so like, I'll also drop some links in for people to reference Blackman Radicals um, has some reading lists that people can look into to learn more about uh, Black Brazilian feminism. Perfect. Yeah, because <laughs> we need it. We, we actually, uh, Leila Gonzalez was like my first frame of reference of Black Brazilian feminisms and just Black feminisms generally. So uh, just thank you for this wonderful conversation. It's really an honor to be able to speak with you. Thank you to Trunice, um for just like creating such a special place and creating this I Support Black Women campaign. It's such an honor, seriously. Um, yeah, I just appreciate you so much. And I'm still waiting for a WhatsApp group with you guys because we need to share this information. Oh, I added you. I know, right? We need this. We need like, to keep you want it some up. action. You want some action in the group. You got it. Yeah, right? I need to go there. Y'all need to come here. Yes, 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 yes. I, I kind of, yeah, we would. I would love that one day. I'm have to meet you and take you out and, you know, we got to dance or something. Do something. I know, right? <laughs> Call me your homecoming, Trinice. <laughs> Period. I love Alpha Lambda, so you know I'm I'm with it. I'm with all the things. Yes. Well, y'all, it seems like folks are really like sitting with, you know, and sitting in. Sometimes people have so many questions on Yelly, but it feels like people are just like taking it in. People are like texting me, like I'm crying. No don't problem. cry <laughs> like it's just we're just super honored that you could close us out you know and we hope to be able to do like so much more amazing work with you um and learn from you and build with you I mean I've been to Bahia once for the decolonial black feminist school and I want to go again and again and again and again um just to learn and build so that's something that me and Jamie like dream about and I'm pretty sure 
we'll, we'll scam our way there. We'll figure it out. We yes. will figure yes. out how to get there. But we, Definitely. We Let's create this connection. Like, so institute, we can go there. I can come here and learn. Yes. We, we have to do that work. So yes. we do. Solidarity always. Thank you for everything. Always. Thank you so much, guys. Señor, señora,